Hello and welcome to New Books Network. I'm Pierre Valencia. Why is the internet making us so unhappy? Why, for that matter, is it in capital's interest to cultivate populations that are depressed and desperate rather than driven by the same irrational exuberance that moves money? Sadness is now a design problem. The highs and lows of melancholy are coded into social media platforms. After all the clicking, browsing, swiping and liking, all we are left with is the flat and empty aftermath of time lost to the app. Side by Design by Herk Loving offers a critical analysis of the controversies which drive our online media behaviours. Loving calls for us to embrace the engineered intimacy of social media, messenger apps and selfies, because boredom is the first stage of overcoming platform nihilism. Herk Loving is a media theorist and internet critic who has chronicled the development of internet and network cultures as they came of age alongside him. He is the author of Zero Comments, Network Without a Cause, Social Media Abyss, and most recently, Stuck on the Platform. He is the founder of the Institute of Network Cultures in Amsterdam, where we met. Gerd, welcome to the show. Pleased to meet you. My name is Gerd Loving, and we're here in Amsterdam inside my office at the, the Institute of Network Cultures. Thank you for welcoming me here. We are talking at the fringes of a conference and a book launch in which I have the luck to participate. Tomorrow, talking about memes, um, but that's not what we're going to be doing today. Today, we're going to be dealing with something much more rounded. We're going to be talking about being sad on the internet. Let's start with something even bigger. How does one study the internet? How have you studied the internet? As you said, we, we're at an Institute of Network Cultures, which is one of, I think, very, very few such institutions in the world. And you lament in the book the lack of lack of study, um, studies performed formally within academia on the internet. So it'd be good maybe for our listeners to understand a little bit how you've come where you are and, and how you have evolved in your research along with the beast. Yeah, my approach uh, is uh, maybe uh, what you could call, you know, a, um, a ethnographic, a critical ethnographic approach, which means that uh, I do not mind uh, to see myself and the, and the work that we do as uh, people who are on uh, on the fringes and on the front lines and uh, document and mm -hmm. um, try to reflect, try to summarize, try to conceptualize with the aim to bring the field further and go in two directions. Very simple. The one direction is to critique to understand, uh, to analyze, and uh, you know, to really get a deep understanding. The other direction is, of course, with that knowledge, to change uh, the course of things, which means that we uh, develop uh, you know, alternative interfaces, communities, uh, communities of practice, uh, research networks, primarily working with uh, uh, programmers, designers, artists, activists and other irregulars. That's quite a lot. We might be able to test some of these claims, given that we're talking about one of your many books that deal with the evolution of the internet. You were just telling me earlier, Side by Design is number six in the whole story. I wonder whether I could ask you to kind of give a little bit of a evolutionary history, where you started and how maybe the terms have been evolving and I want to ask you that so that maybe, given that we're talking a couple of years after the book was released, um, that we can kind of go back and see whether you were right, but also maybe what, what we can learn from, from whether you were right or not. Let me start in the historical year yeah. 2016, because uh, this is a, a very important year. It's the year of you know the election of Trump and... Uh, that's the year we will never leave. It's, no, it's, 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 absolutely. That's the real end of history uh, You know, us. very often we thought, you know, it was going to be 2008 or something like that. But I, I think in retrospect, uh, 2016 is even, is even more pivotal year. Of course, for those in the Ukraine, it must have been, you know, 2014, a little bit earlier. So there are a few things that, that uh, of course, lead up to this year. It's also the year my previous book, um, the Social Media Abyss, uh, came out, and mm -hmm. and I started uh, on on this one, right? I see myself as uh, somebody who uh, writes a chronicle of internet culture. Of course, mm -hmm. you know maybe I'm not uh, I'm not the only one. However, 
you know, I've been around for 30 years. So um, in that sense, I've been doing this for quite a, quite a while. And I have lived through all the stages. The first time I got, encountered the internet, I was uh, 30. You know, so I was already uh, in, in 1989. I was, of course, uh, I was a long-term unemployed uh, <laughs> media theorist. <laughs> and, uh, oh, yeah, that's that's uh, that's uh, uh, you know that's my Werdegang. That's my uh, there, there, you is, know, there is a future for us all. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and uh, but not for me. Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, that's, I know. That's the next and book. That's, yes, and precisely at that moment uh, of ultimate despair after. Um, yeah, a good six years of unemployment. Um, uh, yeah, I encountered the uh, the internet and the whole uh, story uh, around um, virtual reality and cyberspace and um, cyberpunk and uh, a lot yeah. of uh, things uh, from the late 80s that uh, were not just only rumors or nice sci-fi stories, but started to materialize. And yeah, I, in, in, uh, that's when I started. We're now, uh, you know, in 2016, uh, because that's the starting point of this uh, book. Mm -hmm. It's a year in which uh, things really, really started uh, to shift. Th this is um, the the big uh, enclosure. Or there are many names for yeah. it, right? Some people <laughs> talk about the great regression. Uh, others, uh, you know, uh, emphasize at that very moment in time the the kind of the extractivist techniques of uh, of Silicon Valley were at their height. It's also the year of, of uh, Cambridge Analytica, of course. So the, it's the year in which this kind of a, um, very subtle behind our bag manipulation was at its height. Mm -hmm. And uh, the conceptual understanding of it, what was going on at that very moment was very poor, right? Mm -hmm. So we came kind of from Web 2.0 and we came from an idea that... Uh, you know the users were involved, and uh, and that uh, there was a, this kind of a participatory element there, and that this was the driver. This was the mm -hmm. age, early age of online video, of blogs, and that age, that era, we already felt. You know, was kind of coming to uh, a close. Of course, the years before that, it was um, you know the financial uh, meltdown in in two thousand eight. And a, quite a long period uh, of uh, of a some, somewhat mild recession uh, was happening. Uh, the, so the stagnation was kind of already there. But in in 2016, I feel from there on, uh, it really started to manifest itself. Mm -hmm. it, its might, its power, and, and this is what I describe uh, in this book, so all centered around this and the central notion of uh, of the platform as um, you know a new form of uh, of enclosure Ma started to, to really manifest itself and uh, for a lot of users this for the first time became in, uh, apparent so no more empowerment but mm. enclosure i'm going to attempt a lame joke a few days ago i posted some some pithy thing on facebook about advertising algorithms Clearly, I wasn't funny enough because because one of the responses I got, oh, you just used an ad block. So someone earnestly was trying to give me advice. And then my response was, but look, if you don't watch adverts, how do you know that you're unhappy? So I'm going to ask you, how do we know that we're unhappy online and why are we unhappy online? First of all, I, I think there is an objective uh, tendency towards that. We can talk about subjective moods mm -hmm. or mental states of mind and uh, uh, as we know uh, there are uh, quite a few of those possible uh, responses or affects that uh, we can express now the question of course that people uh, after this book uh, came out and, and you know became quite uh, successful it was translated in six languages and so on so i ha ha had to very often confront myself mm -hmm. with this question why in particular, sadness, yeah? and, and I think this is this is a fair enough question, you know, mm. because um, there is that full range, right? And, and yeah. people do make a distinction, for instance, between male anger and female sadness, mm -hmm. and that that is an that is an interesting, uh, you know, division that we can make. However, I I think that the fact that people feel that 
uh, they're really in, in trapped. They, they, that they really can't go uh, somewhere else, right? In, in, the, in the classic mm -hmm. capitalist uh, idea of the consumer choice, yeah? if you don't like this, you just go somewhere. If you don't like sadness, you know, you just do, <laughs> you some, yeah, yeah, you yeah, do something else. You, you yeah. pay an extra three dollars, and suddenly happiness is, is exactly. available as we well know. Right? Oh, sorry, sorry. So it's eight dollars for yeah. happiness <laughs> now, as we as know. we well know. So, but unfortunately, uh, it wasn't quite like that. Mm. So these enclosures, the, the, the dependency, the idea that all your friends and family and uh, business opportunities. Uh, uh, work-related stuff is all there and mm, you can't just walk away from it. You can't just yeah. say, oh, well, you know, I don't care. Even if you don't care anymore about your friends or family, you, you know, society will, you know, ask you to log in uh, through Facebook or Google and so on to on, right? Yeah. So there are all sorts of uh, even formal necessities that uh, will keep you there. And the sadness comes up uh, at the moment when you, you feel there's nowhere else to go. Is there nowhere else to go? <laughs> no, of course not. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm coming from the squatter movement. I'm coming from the social movements. And we wanted to believe that there are subcultures, that there is an underground, that there is a, a dark web, that there is a alternative uh, possibilities that we develop uh, open source software and free software in order to make a difference, right? So this is where I come from. This is what I've been doing for 30, 40 years, right? So I have to answer your question in a very honest way. Uh, we believed that uh, there was another internet yeah. possible. Huh? And along the way, we had to find out that this message, the, these apps and whatever we, we developed were completely incapable of uh, competing uh, with, the, with the might of the, yeah. of the platform. I mean, without getting distracted in by, by details, of course, we're witnessing this a little bit. We're recording this conversation maybe a few days after Elon Musk has taken over Twitter. And of course, anyone who has given any any time to Twitter will have already been invited to join Mastodon or however one is pronouncing this. And, and my, my first guess, it will go exactly the way you described. But I want us to get back to this because the questions of subcultures and alternatives is clearly something that preoccupies you. But now I want to ask a slightly more kind of capital and more ideological question. Why is capitalism happy for us to be sad? Why this particular mode of exploitation has become so dominant, particularly in the period that you are writing about in this book. And I think the second question then is, how does that start changing in online cultures over the pandemic, where, where this kind of feeling, the feeling of stuckness and being not, not being able to go anywhere is actually motivated by something very different. So, you know, why, why, does, why does Klaus Schwab at World Economic Forum want us to be, to be unhappy? Yeah, it's definitely counterintuitive. Uh, and it's for a long time, it wasn't really where I wanted to go, and also it wasn't really, uh, you know, something that I had always uh, aspired to study or let alone promote. In in the sense, uh, you know, I'm myself not a melancholic uh, you, person. You, you look perfectly well adjusted <laughs> to all of this. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, it it is really the young people, the, the student, my own son, who who is now twenty. So the, there's a whole uh, n new generation, particularly the Gen Z ones. Yeah. So they, they kind of embodied it. They incorporated it and they cultivated uh, it. And uh, Klaus Schwab hasn't uh, done that uh, for us. And I think um, they came into this uh, uh, quite late, uh, to, to be honest, because in the official, let's say, business management um, marketing literature, uh, this was not really planned. Yeah. And there are still no books about this, right? So it is not an official uh, religion. Even Google and Facebook will continue den uh, to deny that all this is going on. The only thing is uh, what, what they say is you've been on the internet too long and we'll give you some apps to reduce your screen time. Yeah. Right, so this is this has been their their only response so far. So we have this this paradox when we have this kind of wellness industry, which is of course yeah. app based, but at the same time we have 
whistleblowers like Francis Hagen saying, we are manipulating exactly. you, you're exhausted. And, 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 and quoting them, yeah. and they are really, and, and those sources, even up to now, and we are now, let's say, a good five years later, those sources, they're very rare. We know yeah. that um, there are uh, everywhere in the industry behavioral uh, psychologists working that kind of uh, tweak uh, the systems and that, uh, f for instance, the way, um, you know, YouTube works, where it offers you, you know, <laughs> uh, videos that are, in fact, worse. These are conscious, uh, you know, uh, design uh, and algorithmic, uh, you know, decisions. This has been programmed. It, it, it's not accidental, right? You yeah. could say, okay, the AI just learns and... Uh, figures out that more and more people will uh, go in that direction. No, uh, I mean, that, that's, uh, it doesn't work like that. We know that, uh, right? So uh, a lot of this has been done uh, in the laboratories through trial and error, and yes. not so much through learning algorithms or, or an AI that is uh, kind of uh, superior to us all. So I think even within that, we need to be a little bit more granular because you, what you just just invoked is this kind of funnel where we start watching, uh, you know, influencer videos about cat food and we end up with mm -hmm. school shootings, mm -hmm. you know, this kind of trajectory yeah. of the YouTube mm -hmm. algorithm. But at the same time, there was a maybe more female than male trajectory, maybe slightly younger, in which one just gets into this kind of endless TikTok loop, which is, of course, you know, something that capitalism really wants. I mean, the, the Ch Ch Chinese developers are much better at manipulating people, and we, mm. we know this from the human rights record. They, they, yeah. they know how to do this even well. And there is indeed a good amount of study on those effects. I'm thinking in particular of Jonathan Haidt, for instance, who's written about the psychology of you know, a Facebook addict, you know, mm. the fact that a 14-year-old girl is essentially lost. But you do, you do go in the book into, into this kind of various types of of sadness, you know, melancholia and, and mm. hatred. You have one of these beautiful, I don't think this is you, uh, but, but you attribute to something to Andrew Kolb, you say that you, we overcome sadness not through happiness, but through a hatred of this world. So I, I'm interested in how you see these different types of emotional responses and how they correspond to different network architectures and different algorithmic architectures. And I'm maybe using this as an invitation to get you to talk about you know, the differences between networks and platforms mm -hmm. and so on. So to some of this kind of technical aspects that might help us to, to think about, about this effect. The industry we're talking about here is, is primarily driven by uh, advertisement so, mm. and driven by the planned desire uh, to, to keep you there. Because um, the, what is really uh, the most um, precious commodity out there uh, is time. So, th so the, the attention economy is very, uh, you know, um, foundational uh, in this respect. Uh, we need to uh, stay there. We need, we need to spend more, more time. And all this time is meticulously, uh, you know, measured and, um, and will be further studied and, and monetized at, uh, at some point, right? And I, I think this is a, a fundamentally different architecture from what earlier on uh, we maybe from from the first or second generation of the internet thought or uh, was going to be uh, you know the network yeah. uh, uh, approach uh, in which things are much more loose, uh, things are much more uh, fluid. And um, for instance, uh, it, it is much easier to jump from one network to another for a network to grow, you know. And of course, there are uh, phases, and we know that uh, from the dynamics of uh, virtual communities that also communities themselves, you know, can get can get stuck. Yeah. The difference there is that that this is a community of a few hundred people. <laughs> Uh, not uh, you know not uh, 3.5 billion, and so so the difference here is really one of scale, and uh, the, the the scale of all this is kind of unprecedented, and we kind of got used to it, uh, but uh, we need to remind ourselves really time and again, uh, you know, to this this very uh, question: Why uh, is Twitter that that is considered really a kind of a small uh, yeah. entity. 
you know, has 650 million uh, people on it. I mean, uh, you know, that, that, that's beyond uh, imagination of, of uh, have you any idea what that, what, what, how, how we should, you know, deal with that. These are entities that, uh, that we can no longer uh, really uh, comprehend. And of course, you could say, okay, well, it's a platform, and inside that platform, there are networks and networks mm -hmm. of networks and so on. You could break it down. And of course, you could say, okay, they're distinct because uh, uh, people speak different languages. They're on different parts of the world in different cultures and so on. Yeah, we can try so to. Definitely, but you, don't, you don't even follow me on Twitter, so we're definitely very separate. Yeah, <laughs> no, exactly. Right? So the, the sheer size of it, economies of scale, the, that's what defines our, uh, our age. And, uh, you know, if we say, okay, we, we have some kind mm. of... Um, uh, longing or nostalgia for for uh, decentralized uh, local networks. Well, you know, mm, there's a good reason for that. I'm not saying you know this is justified or that we 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 should and that there is a path back, you know, for humankind to start mm. with. Is there, you know, is there a, a way uh, out of this uh, where uh, you know we're at, at the point of where the internet now. This year has reached um, the five billion mark mm. uh, of the amount of of users. I cannot really uh, can get over how we need to think this. One of the things that I wanted to, when I was trying to think of you know, slightly provocative questions, or whether to push back a little bit, I wondered whether there isn't in our not just yours but in our collective intellectualized or sometimes academic understanding of the internet, the same kind of metropolitan liberal tendency as we have in a lot of other research and cultural theory. And I was trying to figure out whether, in fact, a lot of the phenomena that we notice on Twitter or notice on Facebook or rather of statements that we make about these, these platforms don't actually apply in a very particular way to us as you know, heavy users, you know, people who are online in inverted, inverted commas, and whether, in fact, there isn't a whole subsection of the kind of forgotten, you know, rural, post-industrious town. You know, what, what about people who didn't go to university? What did they talk about on Twitter? And I was actually finding, to kind of in, in response to that, I realized that you do address a bit of this in a book by talking about how underdeveloped internet studies are as a discipline. So it's kind of not really surprising that when, you know, when, when academics, even though you have just early before we press, press record, you told me that you're not an academic, that we're not in a university. It's kind of not surprising that we are fascinated with our own culture, but it's essentially a liberal culture talking about liberal culture. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you whether, whether you, you do have an inkling, like how, how does the Indian subcontinent mm -hmm. represent itself on social media? How do we account for a village in southern England, to, whose, whose private Facebook group I infiltrated recently. How, how do we account for the fact that they are complaining about the graffiti that's just turned up on the underpass? And that's all. Oh, well, they've uncovered a pedophile, so I guess there's something in common with the rest of the network there. Are those platforms, those parts of the platforms, prone to exactly the same kind of affect economies that, that, that you, you describe in a book? Because, of course, they're, they're equally well exploited algorithmically. That's, you know, that's... These are the big numbers on which the platform relies. They don't particularly care whether they're talking to people who, who know what they're doing or not. So I, I am the first to admit that, you know, these are Western uh, concerns. And um, I do uh, write about the, the fact that uh, these uh, platforms uh, for a lot of uh, people in the global south are absolutely necessary uh, communication tools to keep up to date uh, and to be in contact uh, while, uh, you know, they have to travel for, for hours uh, and commute uh, really long distances uh, when parts of their uh, family or tribes are in completely different parts uh, of the world uh, where, you know, there's still uh, a, a huge gap between uh, half of uh, humankind that now uh, lives in uh, urban circumstances and the other half, you know, in which, uh, which they're still uh, in contact with. So, you know, we're still... Uh, half of humankind is is uh, still rural, and of course now you know just recently uh, it it, uh, it tipped and uh, it's a, it's a bit over over fifty uh, fifty percent. So all these reasons 
indicate that uh, you know the, the the technology, especially uh, through mobile and, and smartphones, are absolutely vital to survive for the for the vast majority uh, of people on this on this planet, mm. and that what we are talking about here is some kind of uh, luxury or and it kind of explains also what we try to do here we try to explain why these platforms became so big or why how their extractivist logics uh, work how surveillance works and all, all these all these kind of things but for uh, ordinary users uh, you know it's not like uh, they ignore this or they they they, they have a very good sense uh, of this, mm -hmm. but uh, their urgencies uh, and uh, you know daily struggles and will to survive is a very different one. So this, I guess we arrive at a question of responsibility, and you know, like, and as much as we we acknowledge that nobody knew what was going to happen at the recent you know um, watershed, two thousand sixteen eight, and you know when, when the first first version of Facebook appeared, we we didn't know what would happen, but now now we do because mm -hmm. there's still another half of the world's population that's going to, that's only getting into the technologies that we already took for granted five ten years ago. But this is this is something that you illuminated in the book for me in an interesting way. You track the trajectory from media to networks to platforms. And the thing that really arrested me all of this is the story you bring up of IBM, International Business Machines, being already involved in, in the Holocaust. There's no, no, no nice way of saying that. Everyone knows the story that Fanta was invented by the Nazis, but that it strikes me that the IBM story is way more important. And in fact, damn it, we already knew everything. How is it that we that we still pretend that we don't know? What is missing in the ethnography? What is missing in the theorization? Mm. I'm using in this particular chapter a lot of the, uh, the insights, let's say, from Italian and German autonomous movements and, mm -hmm. and thinkers from the 1970s. And uh, their uh, central claim, it, it's kind of late, let's say, class struggle theory, yeah. right? So it, it, it comes from really in the 1968 movements and um, and then runs into the very dark 1970s mm -hmm. when when things really get st stuck in their own in their own ways but one central term that i find really really uh, fascinating is this idea of the technologische angriff the technological mm -hmm. attack uh, that is there and that this is uh, this is targeted against uh, the, the kind of vital uh, forms in which uh, workers, communities, wh whoever, organize themselves. And the technological uh, attack um, consists really of, um, of these uh, uh, stages that uh, you know, I describe there. Uh, and the IBM is a perfect uh, example uh, for that, uh, going from the census very early on, right? In the late 19th century, uh, IBM machines were developed for the first American census, uh, which means tracking of the population, counting them, right? Quantified approach. And then what we see uh, is that this technology then, uh, in the, the, the setting of the late 1930s, gets instrumentalized to not just uh, count, and uh, let's say create an overview of the whole uh, population, but uh, to target very specific groups to identify them and then to exterminate them, right? So it, it's the, the counting, uh, the identification, and then the extermination. And, and it is this uh, a kind of logic that uh, we see happening time and, uh, mm -hmm. and again, especially in times of crises. And that's what we forget because, you know, it's not always crisis, right? Uh, it's not, there's not always war in the Ukraine, right? No, but it's happening right now. Yeah. And, and that's what happens. And in such a moment, these mechanisms uh, start uh, to uh, become apparent uh, again and start to uh, perform, if you like. Kind of paradoxical because Ukraine, as far as I've I've been able to ascertain, is actually one of the European states that's more 
more avowed of, of like citizen facing technology than, than any other. You know, Ukrainians you know, register their, their cars and claim the pension through an app on the phone, and they have done so for a long time, long before even the, the, the European Union Let states. The Germans. <laughs> yeah, like, it's incredibly strange that this is where we've got. You mentioned the, the role of class thinking, class struggle, and class theorization. And I wanted to use that to go back to something you mentioned in passing in the book, which is the kind of Althusserian model of. Uh, the creation of ideologies, ideologies kind of traditionally until a few decades ago being mostly promoted by the state, maybe more by capital independently. We both know the um, the New York artist Joshua Sitarella, who's one of the people who has been studying ideologies, which E with an A, B, C, D, E at the beginning, which, which are these kind of very weird online only sets of beliefs, which might be fleeting, might be, might be fashion, you know, they're like kind of mini punk movements essentially. But you make, a, you make an attempt at trying to redefine the role of social media in spreading, maintaining, but more, more importantly, producing ideologies. What is it that Mark Zuckerberg wants us to believe in as an ideology? How does that square with what, what Zizek tells us about ideology? Mm -hmm. And what does it, how does it square with the state? What's the role here? If we study the, the language of uh, Mark Zuckerberg, which uh, I think is uh, important and we need to uh, do that, because uh, he's an unprecedented, uh, you know, influential mm. person that you know defines the lives and um, modes of communication from nearly uh, three billion uh, people on this uh, on this planet. Which is, uh, you know, who can say that? In his term, there's there's a strange uh, mix of uh, let's say a Thatcherite kind of emphasis on the individual or on the small entities around it, like family, mm. uh, friends, and so on, right? A really a kind of almost a naive idea of um, uh, a harmonious uh, a life in which uh, mm, we just uh, have uh, uh, encounters and exchanges with friends and family, right? But this, is the, this is the core uh, like belief system. a pre-internet society, oh, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, uh, and this is what Mark Zuckerberg claims. That he, uh, you know, is digitizing and and then uh, facilitating on uh, on his platform. But he always uh, mentions something else on, on top of that, and that's this very Catholic uh, notion of the community. You know? yeah. In almost uh, uh, you know every uh, speech, he comes back. He comes back to that because he believes even that these. Um, you know, close to three billion uh, users in themselves are a community, and he talks to them <laughs> directly as the Facebook community, yeah. right? And yeah, and there's only there's very few people who can do that, and you know, his his close competitor really is the Pope, uh, you know, who uh, who has a, a you know a little bit less huh? less of a following. But um, that's, a, he, that's a comparison. Uh, I've kudos for that. I, I've never conceptualized it. Like no, that. but uh, that's, that's, that's that's very serious. Too. But that just in terms of uh, you know also the way the, uh, both of them can address uh, you know their constituency as as a whole as a, something that um, yeah and and there uh, we need to uh, let's say look a bit further into this uh, notion of the community. You know, and of course, there, he would be the first to say, "Okay, there's not one. Okay, we have um, there are many communities, and so on, so on, right?" But that is is not the interesting uh, bit of it. What is uh, the interesting bit there is is this idea of uh, the community that is uh, slightly looking into itself, hmm? mm -hmm. right? And so it has a dynamic in itself. Uh, it has values, and uh, yeah. It has a certain a certain unity, and it's kept together. In this case, I would say by software and uh, by interfaces, and um, yeah, by a whole in a whole ecosystem, yeah. probably also of cables, undersea cables, data centers, and so on. Right. So there's a certain technological unit uh, there, and, and Mark Zuckerberg really tries to emphasize that the positivity of this. Mm -hmm. Right. That in the end, it is all about 
you know, the good intentions and the, the wellness of, uh, of, of people and the prosperity for us all. I think we're in an incredibly interesting moment because we've got to the point where the social networks and in fact a lot of the political and economic factions that are global come with very distinct figureheads behind them. So, you know, you mentioned the Pope and of course we know what the doctrine there is. Daddy Elon now getting behind Twitter really makes it incredibly clear what a billionaire might want to do with a social network. And okay, granted, let's let's pass by all the stuff that he wanted to change his mind and frankly doesn't appear to know what he's doing, even though that, that is irrelevant. You know, whether he knows what he's doing it does, does, doesn't, doesn't really matter. But he makes it quite clear that he aligns himself with a ideology of long-termism, which which are sort of insulting to anyone who might be paying him eight dollars a month, <laughs> given that they're essentially being told that they, you know, we're being told we don't matter for now. What matters is that only the best of us, his will friends, survive. his friends, will survive. And and these are things that you know might be might be frightening to an extent. And this is what maybe the exodus of, from Twitter was trying to react to. But what what I think is more important is that we end up contending with the real importance of these ideologies. Mm. The, fact that, the fact that Elon has dropped the ball and told us out loud, it, it's only an indictment of our stupidity because he's been telling us, the audience, they've been telling all, us all of this for a long, long time. Don't, don't mean to sound conspiratorial when we're in the, at, at the realm of complete openness, when, when it is that we're being told almost in the terms and con- terms of service, what are we signing up for? Yeah, you know, I, I really like it that you come back to this um, idea of ideology or ideology, uh, for that matter, which I think is a term that is a bit more specific, mm-hmm. uh, focused on, um, let's say, subcultures, and um, but still very, uh, very strong, and uh, uh, I would say reflects also what uh, what is really going on, especially in the world of uh, of young people, which, uh, you know might sound like uh, oh, you like young people no I, I you know i don't uh, <laughs> it, 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 this is not the ma- this is not a question of liking of of taste yeah. come on uh, we also they're, need they're, they're going to be in charge but yeah, so we, we, we better, we'd better that, figure but, out what uh, we have to say if to you, them if you ever looked at demographics you know think of uh, you know think of africa the, the vast yeah. majority of the people on this planet are young people yeah. come on yeah so and so this is this is not uh, some kind of uh, romantic uh, notion not only will they be the drivers you know uh, if you're thinking uh, in terms of uh, sci-fi or cli-fi you know uh, climate mm-hmm. uh, fiction or something like that you know where uh, where you kind of extrapolate and then you know they help you a little bit uh, to get a better understanding of uh, of what disasters are are ahead. No, yeah. it's not just about that. It, it's also the factual reality, and uh, the, these ideologies are uh, lived. Uh, and this is what, from Althusser to Zizek, etc. We we all. Uh, it, it's not just a fixed idea in your head or uh, something like a nice story, a fairy tale. No, ideology is is lived. It's embodied. It's uh, it, it's. Not just only embodied in your in your phone, but also literally mm. uh, in in your body, right? And a lot of people, especially when we're talking about the, the mental states that we study, yeah. when we're talking about exhaustion, boredom, melancholy, anxiety, all the all the elements, right? These are mental states, techno mental states, in, in in my point of view, that immediately have bodily, not just the repercussions, but the, are inscribed in the body, in the brain, uh, in the nerve system, in the postures, in, you know, in all aspects of uh, what we uh, could call, you know, the, the human body and uh, how it operates. And, that, and of course, how we understand today in 2022, how the body operates, of course, which is different from even 20 years ago, 50 years ago, or uh, you know, so we, we we even see in neuroscience and so on, right? We see enormous uh, progress also in a, in a, a deeper understanding. And uh, I my prediction is, for instance, that uh, we will uh, very soon again go back to uh, a classic of psychoanalysis. You know, in terms of uh, dream analysis, in terms of uh, exploiting or get a better understanding 
of the way um, we dream. And so this is uh, another kind of frontier for, for these, uh, these, these companies, right? Uh, so th th there, there are, there's a lot of uh, new frontiers that still can be um, explored and uh, exploited. I'm just saying, right? The, the stuff we well, I have I have a question to this, which is actually <laughs> sort of broke my mind, which is what will sadness look like in the metaverse? So, you know, when we, when we actually have gone to the point where the disembodiment that, that Zuckerberg is proposing for us has been achieved, what what is left of our emotions? And I, I'm quite heartened to hear you, you, you mention psychoanalysis as a tool, because that's something that if we have any any hope for academia, that there should be some pushback to a certain extent. It's not like Silicon Valley has to reinvent the understanding of the human brain and the subconscious. It will no doubt be very good at exploiting it, more so than, than the therapeutic and academic spheres, but at least the foundations are there. But how would you yeah, speculate I, about that aspect yeah. of, the, of the future? The okay, we let's, need to let's, go let's, back let's, there let's to, to Shishek again. Yeah. And let's do a uh, bit of depressing and then yeah. we end with on, on something mm -hmm. positive, maybe. <laughs> I see. Uh, yeah, well, sadness in the metaverse for me um, has got to do with this tendency uh, that is always there, uh, what Robert Faller and then also um, Slavoj Žižek uh, calls the tendency towards interpassivity mm. and so interpassivity is obviously a, a mirror concept yeah. to interactivity right we're always invited to to interact and so on and so on and what i think uh, is uh, so nice about the metaverse is that you you can uh, explore it you you can move around in in your avatar but uh, because you it is um, at least presumed to be an endless, uh, you know, 3D environment. It has a, a little bit more um, the element in it of exploration and also of uh, enjoyment and just seeing what's going on, right? So in that sense, the, the, I, I consider a good metaverse like a you know, European or American 19th century street where a lot of stuff is happening, right? That we, all, yeah. that we now miss, right? Yeah. right? And so there is a, there is a, there is a lively, liveliness, but also an element in, in the sense of interpassivity, in the sense of that we can, let's say, take part again in the social. And yeah. so that, yeah, yeah and... Uh, and, and it's not just only about this this uh, strong pressure on the self to kind of express uh, its self representation, its its uh, its online self, and so on. Right. Um, so the, the, what what I would say is the promise of of the metaverse is uh, is that we can uh, get rid of the self. That's a big claim. Um, I wonder if it's going to come up and. And Meta's marketing copy, they have just like Twitter got rid of about a tenth of the workforce. I doubt, this week. I doubt, because uh, they, you know, for them, it is in the end about uh, creating uh, just another, uh, you know, 3D version mm. of the online profile, which uh, always that's needs... the cheap way. That's, yeah, that's the cheap but way. Uh, I, I think there is still uh, the promise of um, of the avatar that uh, kind of supersedes this and also mm. what I call, you know, the online uh, crowd or the, the tribe or, or even the online mob for that matter, you know, that has a, a very different uh, aim and um, the, the metaverse, uh, you know, can uh, also lead uh, to uh, very new forms of uh, crowd and mob behavior that Mark Zuckerberg for sure has not yet... Uh, 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 anticipated, right? I think that question of the, the fact that the future of these technologies is in fixed is very important to keep in mind. So we've already covered our responsibility for what we already know about legacy technologies being still spread around the, the particularly the global south. But um, the critic Dean Kissick has written quite interestingly about the kind of vo conceptual void of the metaverse, and I explored this in some of my writing as well. So he made this case for artists, even though I never think that artists are a good solution to any politics, but he, I think, quite astutely pointed out that Zuckerberg has no idea what the metaverse is for and what it will do. 
And that's not a critique of him. That's just where we are. You know, he's, he can still end up, end up winning this particular game. But Kissick made the argument that actually what Zuckerberg needs is artists to come and go and do experiments. In fact, what you want to, what you should be doing now is to give all these American teen, teenagers who are who are at the moment shit posting on Discord, give them give them goggles and make them you know go and make the metaverse and we'll pay your art school fees or you know whatever the equivalent is. So that means that there is some responsibility for a particular creative class. In, in a certain sense, to go and try to rescue the technology. Now, it wouldn't be the first time this has happened. And in fact, I was telling you earlier, the reason I, I, I remembered your name and I thought it would be good to talk to you is that I read an essay of yours in which you made it quite clear that you don't think the museum and therefore the art world is the space in which the revolution is going to come hard agree. So my question, if we, we are to be like artificially or superficially, positive, where do the influences come from that can still shape platforms, because that's the paradigm we're in, in a sense that is not foreclosed? You, you mentioned earlier alternative forms of software, you know, open source kind of stuff, which, which has got a long le legacy. We already mentioned Mastodon. But what are the kind of bigger are there bigger alternatives? Who's, who's going to save us? I would say uh, not, not safe. Um, <laughs> I'm, because, I'm, I'm, of course, uh, being no, facetious no, no, because here. I, I, you know, I, I have to give an inaugural speech next week, and uh, mm. that's about the uh, extinction internet. So I, I don't think uh, it's about savior uh, so much, but I do believe that um, uh, there are uh, new forms of uh, the social possible, mm -hmm. and this, this is how I. Uh, also read, um, you know, Dean's uh, invitation, uh, and, and I, I, uh, I agree uh, with that, right? So the experimentation there should not just be about uh, some new form of uh, self-representation in that space, right? Which is bizarrely what the art world is obsessed with yeah, at the moment, exactly. to its peril. But, yes, yeah. so uh, we should um, offer, you know, the, uh, the lonely <laughs> hearts club band that is out there, uh, to precisely uh, overcome that uh, trap, that tendency, in which uh, I think the art world also ran into um, mm. in the case of uh, Instagram. Um, but to understand this moment uh, as, a, as, a, as a moment uh, to uh, reshape the, the social in unheard uh, ways, right? And I'm, I'm not saying it should be a tribe. I'm not saying, please don't uh, go back to the community. Don't uh, even think also, mm. of course, in, 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 in my terms, that uh, it should necessarily be uh, a, a network. I, I, I believe uh, that uh, maybe it's going to be uh, something more, probably more evil, or something more, more, more primal uh, than, mm. uh, than, than that. And uh, so uh, the, the idea you know, of uh, salvation um, should uh, really be, uh, be, be skipped. But nonetheless, new forms of experience uh, of the social is something, of course, that the, the gaming world uh, has uh, announced for, for, for already for, you know, for many, many years, if not decades. And um, I see this world more as a, as a predecessor of, uh, of what we've known uh, in the world of gaming, and, and not so much uh, in the, uh, you know, it, it, as a reference to uh, the social media, which I think were mm. in the end hopelessly uh, still uh, to the based on uh, kind of an old understanding of advertisement. And, uh, and we know that yeah. from the crypto world, you know, an old understanding also of uh, monetization, of, uh, of value creation, and of a new form of the, the social, which is, uh, you know, also called the, the commons. Mm -hmm. uh, the, there are new forms of the commons uh, possible. The, the, the current uh, leading uh, Silicon Valley uh, companies have very, very little, if no idea. Are you talking about, about initiatives like, like Web, Web 3.0 kind of conglomeration? Or yes, I, definitely. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's an exponent. Definitely, uh, yeah, and I'm, uh, I'm absolutely in, um, in favor of that. But it should not just be about you know in individual gains or uh, yeah. speculative moves where you know you're happy uh, 
uh, if the Bitcoin uh, goes up a few hundred um, dollars. This is that is not uh, what it, what it uh, what yeah, this yeah, is no, about. That, that's that's playing playing against yourself really in the end. I'm I'm kind of happy that you've you've taken us back down. Of course, facetiously use the word salvation, and unfortunately, I am a I am a classic doomer. I, the last question to do with that, I wanted to ask you about something that's plagues me and what I'm going to be at the conference you're hosting tomorrow trying to talk about, which is the, the question of why certain network effects favor the political right and have very little space for the political left. Particularly, I'm interested in notions of embodiment. Which which you you favoured, I, I I think, or at least you you advocated taking very seriously, and questions of community. So here, unlike in the embodiment questions, I I have enough evidence from this kind of post liberal post left space that I I hang out in to know that there is there is a movement to back towards the community, your traditional community, and bizarrely. People who started off online on the Substack with kind of weird followings, you know, Curtis Yavin and so those kind of characters, who are in some senses really Silicon Valley thinkers and also exponents of this kind of hyper ideologies, you know, where you really put together the most ridiculous two words and suddenly there's a whole belief system. They are successful on the back of platforms and they somehow manage to use them to bring back without so much fuss, come back to the old-fashioned 1970s question of the community, like pre-Reaganite, pre-Thatcher idea of a community. Is, is that what's missing for the left? Why, why, why is it not working out for, 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 yeah, we for the two that, politics uh, equally? You know, the, the classic uh, tools for, for organization uh, no, no longer work, right? So uh, the, the, what the left is, still hasn't really uh, left behind is its preoccupation with the political party and the trade unions. Mm. And this is a critique of the 1970s and uh, nothing has uh, happened with that uh, since, right? Uh, of course, I come from a generation who uh, naively or not expressed uh, the idea that uh, you know, the social movements uh, somehow could be uh, an alternative or, or a local communities for that matter as a kind of a more crystallization manifestation uh, of the of the larger uh, social movements so in our understanding uh, you know the movements would always uh, be be grounded in the localities but the, the, that has not resolved the question of organization mm. and i think the, w w where the left at the moment um, still fails to do it is uh, is to openly admit that uh, the current uh, forms of uh, uh, organizations, and then also related to that, of course, representation, and then ultimately decision making, yeah, uh, um, yeah, that th these things no longer work, and that people no longer you know, recognize themselves in these institutional uh, farce that uh, that is uh, that is out yeah. there, which is a relic uh, of the past. So the, my call would be to experiment with new forms of, of organizations. And together with Ned Rossiter, I've, I've you know, come up with one very, very small uh, kind of contribution there. We, we kind of played with the idea of organized networks, like, yeah. like small, smaller units, mm -hmm. but, but that still try to maintain a, a kind of a core belief in the idea of, of networks and that some of these networks, for instance, can have trans-local uh, elements, right? Which is what the experiment we do here uh, in our Institute of Network Cultures at the moment with hybrid events, right? Where we kind of envision that you and I, we are in the room here, but maybe, you know, here at these two chairs, there are people sitting here who are not here, but join us. <laughs> right, uh, and this kind of um, idea that uh, others hmm, can uh, can be can be equally present, right, is still a novel uh, is still a novel idea, and uh, it's something that uh, I think the, the 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 coming generations will really start to experiment with. Hmm? So it's not just a romantic idea of going back to the countryside or going back to offline, going back to um, 
the real neighborhood, you know, that no longer exists, right? No, but we should uh, instead uh, experiment with the new forms of the social. That is a techno-social, of course, but uh, obviously not, you know, techno-determinist. Yeah, I'm, I wish I could find this as inspiring as kind of happy making as, as you might be. Because as you were saying, I was thinking both about Mastodon, which is of course in the news, but then in my, in, in my ear, this constant ringing about this platform called Urbit that you might have come across, um, which is, I came to understand only after someone talked to me about it for three hours, that it was actually the invention of Curtis Yavin, who I'm very sure is not interested in the same kind of politics that you are trying to underpin here. I'm skeptical of the fact that the machine is Mm -hmm. predetermined to be evil. This is one of the small bits that I kind of took issue with some of the of the argument in, in your book. But then historically, unfortunately, evidence is on your side <laughs> rather than mine. Maybe we should leave this on this depressing note because thank because there's all but yeah. thank you. There's all to play for, I think. Um if I'm rendered happy by by the end of our conference, I shall record an addendum <laughs> to, to our conversation. Thank you very much, Kurt. Thank you. Sad by Design by Hert Loving is published by Pluto Press. I'm Pierre Lorenzo, and the editor is Marshall Poe. Thanks for listening, and join us next time.